Praxis Prepper. Hey everybody, this is Praxis. And in this video, I'm going to talk about the three things that you need to do to protect yourself and your family from radiation if there was ever a nuclear exchange between major world powers. We're looking at that potentially right now. Nobody's very excited about, well, there are probably a few people in the world that are very excited about that, but the vast majority of the rest of us sane people are not very excited about that. But, you know, some, sometimes you don't get to choose the future that's waiting there for you. All you can choose is how you deal with it. You know, that's what we're left with. So what are the three things that you can do to protect yourself and your family? The first one is to protect your body from radiation. Now, that's a pretty big one, and we're going to tackle that one first. Uh, that challenge is different depending on you know where you are temporally from whatever event might happen. When an event happens, the worst of it, it's at the, it's at the beginning, the first couple hours, the first couple days, the first couple weeks, first couple months, first couple years are going to be uh, you know uh, exponentially worse than the time that follows. So especially right after an event, you want to get yourself into an area where you, are, where you are protected from radiation. Now everybody's got different search, uh, situations, so I'm not going to say you know there's a one size fits all for everyone. Where I am sitting right now is inside of my root cellar at my uh, my house, with, which I also built such that it could be used as a fallout shelter. This is our kind of plan A if you know the unthinkable happens. Um, not everybody's got a situation like this. Most people don't have a situation like this. For other people that uh, you know don't have a root cellar, you know what can you do? Well, you can build your own. If you live out in the country, you can build your own root cellar by digging into the ground. Uh, you know, and you know, covering yourself over with uh, you know massive material. Uh, obviously, there, uh, there's a risk factor in putting yourself underground. You know, some people call call that burying oneself alive. Uh, but uh, you know, that's one approach. Uh, I'm going to put a link down in the description below to a great book. It's uh, it's titled something along the lines of Nuclear War Survival Skills. It's a book from uh, you know, a while ago. It's a, it's a few decades old, written by Crescent Kearney, and you can get it for absolutely free. It's offered online for absolutely free because it's, I guess, the person that wrote it, Crescent Kearney, felt that it was just such important information. They wanted to make it available to everyone. Now, I bought a copy myself, and I, I'd highly recommend you have a paper version of it as well because have, just having an electronic version, uh, you know, it's not that useful if uh, you know, there's no electricity to, to read it. So I'm going to put a link down in the description below to the, the paper book itself if it's available. I know that there's a lot of interest in that right now and it might not even be available but you can download your own version of it and there are a lot of plans for how to build your own uh, kind of rudimentary DIY shelter that aren't really expensive this place cost a, a bit of money it was eleven thousand dollars building this root cellar it's just essentially the concrete that I used to put it together uh, plus the the excavating time uh, from the excavators that were working here and everything it ended up being eleven thousand dollars it, it, at the beginning, I was kind of budgeting it to be maybe a little bit less than that, but it took a lot longer to dig down to get it in. You know, there were a lot of rocks and things. By the end, it was like an $11,000 refrigerator, and I was like, Ugh, you know, if I knew it was going to be that much, I probably wouldn't have done it. Um, but at this point, I'm glad that I did because we can use it as a fallout shelter. Uh, but again, different people have different situations. This works for me. If you live in a area where you have access to, like, you know, land space, you know, in rural environment, you could maybe make your own DIY one. You know, if you just live in a regular house, there are ways that you can do it by being in your basement and putting uh, massive material on the floor above you uh, to block radiation uh, from coming down. If you do that, you really have to uh, add a lot of extra supports to the, the floor, because if you just put a lot of weight on a floor above you, the, you know, the floor is not meant to deal with it. It'll just collapse on you and kill you that way, which might be a better way to die than <laughs> dying from radiation. So, uh, you know, it might be a blessing in disguise. But, you know, if you want to avoid that, you know, you definitely have to put more uh, structural supports in there. There's lots of different uh, approaches to it. Again, that book that I mentioned down the links below, you can check it out and you can get a lot of information uh, from there. And all it takes is your time. One of the biggest complaints I hear from people on my channel is people saying, well, you know, yeah, if I had a million dollars, I'd do all the things that you do. You know, I'm not a rich guy. You know, I, I, I probably in my life, the most I've ever earned uh, in a given year was maybe like $40,000. Or so, uh, you know, you know, after all the expenses and everything like that, thirty, forty thousand dollars. That's kind of my income. Uh, I just, I'm good at saving money. I don't like. I, I tend to not spend a lot of it, and I, I spend it on things like, you know, like this and other things. This gives me a sense of happiness. Uh, you know, making projects and, and this kind of thing 
you know, I enjoy it and this is what I do with my money. You don't need a ton of money to do a lot of this stuff. And a lot of stuff, like I mentioned in that book, are kind of free. You know, you can create radiation shielding with dirt. And in a lot of places, dirt's pretty free. If you live in a city or an urban urban environment, there are things that you can do. Uh, you know, there are fallout shelters. There are still fallout shelters in different places. And there are different environments within city um uh, st city spaces that are more useful than others. Uh, you know, the more stuff you have around you, uh, the more uh, protection you have from the outside. Like if you're in a big concrete structure, like a parking garage or something like that, you got a lot of mass around you. Uh, you know, there are all different types of uh, assets around you. Uh, concrete blocks a lot of radi radiation. Metal blocks a lot of radiation. Dirt blocks a lot of radiation. So, you know, think about what your situation is and take one of those environments and you can kind of perhaps modify it. Now, you can't go into like just some random parking garage and start modifying like uh, oh I'm gonna take the take up this corner parking space <laughs> I'm gonna build my little shelter in there I don't think people would be cool with that at this point uh, but uh, you know you can certainly do that for your basement you know make a small area in your basement you know to protect yourself from radiation now that's protecting your body from the radiation that's outside you also need to protect yourself from the radiation that might be wanting to come in from air dust particles you need to filter air that's coming into your space you need to do that in a way where you're not uh, having the filters near your uh, your living area, wherever you're going to be. Um, you know, and the filters can be just re regular HVAC filters that you might use for like an like a, a air dust filter or like an air conditioning system. You know, the, the better the filter, the better the filter that you're getting. And I'd recommend having multiple filters because if there is a lot of dust in the air, you don't want them getting clogged up and then, you know, you're not getting air into your space. You need to be able to breathe, get air in. You're going to need to have access to food. If you're uh, in a shelter, you're going to probably want to be there for two or three weeks, about half of a month. Uh, during that time, the worst of the radiation is going to be buzzing and clicking, you know, all around you on the outside. So you want to be able to not leave that space for at least a couple of weeks. That's a bummer. You know, I mean, if anyone feels claustrophobic, I mean, this is a pretty nice space that I've got here. I don't want to be in this room for two weeks straight, but it's better than dying with like, you know, cancerous boils bubbling out of my skull. So, you know, you, you kind of, you, you know, <laughs> you pick the lesser of two evils sometimes. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you need to plan to be there for about half of a month. Uh, you're going to want food, you're going to want water, and you're going to want to get rid of those things after your body's done using them, if you know what I'm talking about. You know, things go in, things come out. Uh, you need to be able to have a plan for that. Now, uh, if you don't have plumbing, and I, I did not design plumbing into this space, if you don't have plumbing, uh, one way that you can deal with that is just by bagging stuff. You know, uh, you know well, I'm, what I'm sitting on right now, actually, is a five gallon bucket, and you can get camping uh, or uh, toilet seats, or they sometimes are used for boating uh, toilet seats, where you just I uh, can snap this uh, toilet seat on top of a five gallon bucket, put a bag in there, do your business as they say, and then close the bag up. You know, uh, if you were going to be in a environment for two to three weeks, if you like poop once a day, that is, you know, about 14, 15 poops or so. Uh, and then at the end, you can kind of just toss them outside. <laughs> there, you know, I mean, it's a nuclear wasteland anyway. Who's going to care if there's some bags of crap kicking around? Uh, and, uh, you know, and that's what you do. So you need to protect your body immediately from what's outside. You need to filter the air that's coming in. You need to have food. You need to have water. You need to be able to process those wastes on the other side. If you got some spare time and you want to think about it, it might be nice to have uh, something for you and your family to do while you're in that space. If you've got kids, uh, you know, kids aren't really good at just sitting and doing nothing for two weeks straight. Uh, my thinking is uh, one of the great ways of saving money by prepping is by getting things when they're cheaper. Uh, one thing that you can get cheaper now than you probably will be able to get it later is toys. You know, why not do your Christmas shopping right now? You know, buy Christmas toys, put them aside, and if you need to go into a fallout shelter of some sort, bring the Christmas presents in, make it like Christmas during the apocalypse. Oh, it's Christmas time again. What did you get me? The uh, same old thing as last year? Let's see what we got in here. What, is, what are these? Are these eyes? Where did you get these? Where do you think I got them? <laughs> and I, I say that in it's kind of a joking way, but I, I, I mean it. I have a boy, and I've already kind of bought some toys and things that, you know, if there's no nuclear apocalypse, they'll be for Christmas. But if there is, I'll have those things all ready to go. I was going to buy them anyway. The prices aren't coming down, so you're going to save money by buying them now anyway. So. 
you know, have some kind of plan for mental sanity, books, magazines, computers, you know, all that kind of stuff. Now people are going to say, oh, if there's an EMP, you know, what good is your computer going to do you? Well, if there's an EMP, your computer can be like a nice seat or a spacer to like hold something up. <laughs> you know, you, you can't design. There's a lot of non-preppers coming into prepping right now, and you can see the non-prepper mindset working where it's like, well, if something's not 100% perfect, I just wouldn't even want to live in that world, <laughs> you know? Okay, cool. Well, that's that's your option. But for the rest of us, uh, you know, you just try to make things, uh, you know, as good as you can. And, you know, some of your plans work, some of the plans don't work. But the idea that you reasonably can assume that some of your plans might not work out is not a justification for not making any plans at all. Um, although for many non-preppers that seems to be a perfect logic in their head. But yeah, I mean, yeah, there might be an EMP, it might knock out your electric devices, but so what? Okay, so your electric devices uh, you know, don't work. You know, the food still works and everything else. And, you know, did it hurt you to bring the things in? No. And, it, and if they don't get knocked out, then you, you've got that as an extra option. Okay. Moving on. Uh, that's all about protecting yourself from radiation. That's one. Now we're going to move on to number two. I probably should have held up two fingers there. We're going to move on to number two. Number two, the, the next thing that you need to do in order to protect your family from radiation is uh, expect for the information coming from the government to not be entirely accurate. And I don't mean that as, you know, I, if you're new to prepping and uh, preparedness, uh, you might uh, have have the sense of the prepping community that we're all thinking it's like oh everything's a conspiracy and you know the government's all out to get you. Uh, I'm not coming from that angle at all. Um, I, I think that the government serves a purpose. I think that most of the people in government uh, have the best uh, uh, their best intentions in mind in everything they're doing. Most of the people in government anyway. Um, but that said, uh, the way that the system uh, works is best uh, uh, best considered in light of historical events. You know, we can uh, we can all think about like, oh, the way things should be or the way things we, we would like things to be. Well, let's look at the way things are. And let's take the last national emergency as an example, COVID. Uh, you know, what type of information was coming out of the government uh, when COVID was, uh, you know, emerging onto the stage and, uh, and the government, uh, here in the United States anyway, was trying to manage it? Well, uh, you know, a lot of people forget this, but I don't. I remember right out of the gate, uh, the government, and I know this is the government under Trump, so you got to take it with a grain of salt, but uh, the, the government was saying, don't worry, I think there were like 14 cases, they were like, they'll just go away, like magic, I believe that was the phraseology. Uh, after they didn't go away like magic, uh, the next thing that the government was telling us is like, okay, it's around, but it's, don't worry, it's not airborne. There's no reason for anyone to be worried that it's airborne, it's, uh, you know, it's, not, it's not in the air at all, you don't even, even need to wear a mask. Um, then that became pretty obvious that that wasn't true. Uh, so they said, okay, well, yeah, everybody should uh, go out and you should all get a mask. So people started getting masks and then masks ran out. You know, you couldn't get them at the stores anymore. People started to panic and, they, they, you know, they're, I got a lot of angry, uh, you know, comments here on my videos about how I, I'm a prepper. I have masks. But they're good for, you know, wildfire season or nuclear fallout or COVID or, you know, any other type of respiratory uh, situation. I stock um, masks. Uh, and I have videos uh, with me holding masks pre-COVID, uh, you know, big things of masks and saying, hey, you guys should get these too. Well, all the people that didn't listen to that advice, uh, you know, sent me all sorts of nasty uh, messages saying, you're, ho you're hoarding all these masks and, you know, you should be giving those masks to people who don't have them. Um, you know, there was a lot of that beginning. You know, the government could see that people were starting to get angry, that there were the haves and the have-nots. So they started uh, saying, well, you don't actually need real respirators. You can just use, you know, these cloth kind of things. You can make them yourself. Just take any kind of random effing cloth and throw it over your face and, and then you're good. You know, you look like you got a mask on. So, you know, you, you, know, you must get the effects of having a mask on. Um, so yeah, you know, they went there and, you know, and, and it, took a, it took forever. Uh, for them to finally admit, yeah, actually, you know, the paper masks don't really, uh, I'm sorry, not the paper masks, you know, the, those cloth masks, they don't really do anything, they're not really effective, uh, you know, and you should get these N95 masks, uh, or K KN95 masks, because, you know, the cloth ones were, aren't really effective. Um, when did they do that? Well, they did that when the industry finally got to the point where it could make enough for everyone. Um, so, uh, a lot of misinformation there. I, you know, the government talks a lot about like misinformation sources. In fact, I here on this channel have had videos taken down uh, because they were out of step with the narrative. Like, you know, back when uh, the government was saying that 
things weren't airborne. I was suggesting that they probably were. I mean, it's, it's a coronavirus. All coronaviruses are airborne. Why would this one not be? Uh, I've had videos taken down off my channel as being misinformation. Uh, but, you know, clearly a lot of misinformation coming from the government during that uh, disaster. Uh, it wasn't a disaster, was it? No. It was, it was an emergency. It could have been a disaster. As it turns out, we were lucky and it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't on the scale everyone was, was fearing uh, or reacting to. Uh, but, you know, what can we take from that? You know, obviously a lot of misinformation there, but like, what was the angle? Like, why, why were, you know, there was a lot of true information coming out from the government as well. You know, they, they suggested this is a virus. It seemed to be a virus. They suggested it eventually that, yes, you should wear a respirator, you know. So it's kind of a mix of, of untrue stuff and true stuff. Like, where's the dividing line? Well, the dividing line between uh, where it seems like the government will tell the truth or when, when the government feels like it wants to sell, uh, say something that is, um, uh, you know, true uh, seems to be uh, messages that create panic or uh, undermine um, faith in the government. Whenever there is a, uh, a truth that might make people feel nervous, feel like they don't have tr uh, trust in their, their politicians, uh, any kind of a truth that might cause people to panic, that was during COVID anyway. Uh, and countless other uh, emergencies, that was when the government uh, told what many of us would call lies. Uh, you know, let's call them less than truths. <laughs> I don't even know if they're half truth. Um, but uh, yeah, so if you have a situation where the public might be uh, prone to panic or lose faith in their elected officials, uh, the word from the government tends to be whatever is uh, effective to avoid that panic or effective to avoid that uh, erosion of confidence. Uh, you know, and this might sound like me being critical of government and saying, oh, you know, they're so evil, you know, they're, they're telling us lies for their own ends. But, you know, realistically, what is the alternative? If you have a population of people that have been uh, raised to not be able to stand on their own two feet, and suddenly there is a moment when that's kind of the only way that they can take care of themselves is by standing up and, and starting to, you know, stand on their own two feet. If you have a population that you know is not capable of that, at large, what is the function of telling them the truth that's just going to cause them to panic anyway? It doesn't serve any function and um, it, it, it just causes more awfulness. Uh, and myself and many of you guys benefit from the way that government deals with that. Like, for example, right now, we are leading up to what might unfortunately be a third world war. It might be a nuclear war. Um, if the government was really open about that right now, you know, what do you think the general uh, atmosphere for you and for I when we like kind of go out in public, what would it be like? Well, I know for right now, it's pretty easy to go out and get some last preps. It's pretty easy to go out and get fuel and, you know, you know pick up tools and hardware. I'm, you know, working on building this place. I can go to the Home Depot store and I can get the supplies that I need, uh, I would not be able to do any of those things if the government were sending out messages that were scaring the SHIT out of people uh, about the, the severity of the situation that we're facing right now. So, you know, you can say, oh, you know, the government just, it does this stuff to, uh, to benefit itself. And yeah, the government uh, system and many of the people within it do benefit from it. But so do you and I. We can take advantage of the, the peace and the calm that these lies uh, you know, create and, uh, and, and we can create good out of that. And the government has the opportunity to create good out of that, that peace and that calm. So, you know, when, when I'm critiquing the government for not always telling the truth, you know, you know, on some levels, like I said, it sounds like I'm, uh, you know, talking about, you know, the, the government's so evil, you know, they're not, they're not telling us the truth. But, you know, the alternative would be even worse, I, you know, in my, in my personal opinion. So, so what do we do about that? Well, you know, if we are faced with a, uh, you know, a situation, you know, where there's a nuclear war or something, the information coming out of the government, I think, is going to be very similar to what we have been uh, seeing all throughout COVID and what we're seeing now leading up to the potential of this war. The government is telling us things to keep us calm, to uh, preserve our faith in the government's ability to handle everything. Those are going to be the kind of messages that we're going to be getting. Now. Um, that's going to be problematic for people's health, 
in some ways. Now, uh, if you, again, if you look at the larger picture, if the government did the opposite, it would be even more problematic for people's health because people would like lose their SHRT, they'd go crazy, and then that would just be even worse for everyone. Um, but if something like this happens, you're really going to have to read between the lines of everything that the government is saying. So how do you get good information if you, you know, you can't be sure, like, you know, we've known forever that uh, coronaviruses are airborne, but suddenly, you know, it served the public interest to say that they weren't airborne and the government did that. You know, we've known forever that radiation is dangerous to people, but suddenly, you know, if radiation is all over our environment, what's the government probably going to say about that? Well, they're probably going to uh, say things like, it's safe to go out sooner than maybe you or I would think that it's safe to go out. Uh, they might be saying it's safe to eat, drink the water and eat the food, you know, uh, at a time that's earlier than you and I might think that it's safe to do so. So how do you figure out, you know, well, is the government right? Is there, is there any research on this? Uh, you know, are, is your own internal kind of compass on that correct? Uh, you know, what is that based on? Well, my suggestion would be to uh, try to gather information that you can now while it's not politically charged. If you were going to be doing research prior to the COVID epidemic um, you know, uh, occurring and you were going to do research on coronaviruses, you would have found information uh, that suggested that coronaviruses uh, you know, are, use an airborne route for transmission. They use other routes as well, but that's one of their routes for transmission. Uh, that was pretty established science. There wasn't a lot of controversy around that. Uh, it wasn't a politically charged question. Um, once you got into the actual situation, it became incredibly politically charged. There were, uh, you know, different viewpoints all over the place, and it was really kind of hard to tell what was true. But if you went back to those earlier sources, um, it was a lot easier to kind of figure out what was real. So if you're going to be uh, researching what to do, start now and get materials now. You know, some of those materials might even be removed from public uh, availability because they might, you know, they might frighten people. They, they might, uh, you know, disturb people. And, you know, the government might see a, um, a benefit in, you know, getting, uh, limiting people's access to that kind of information. Get the information now. Again, like I mentioned, that book down in the description below, you can get a paper copy, which I would highly recommend, or you can get a digital copy for absolutely free. Um, you know, getting materials like that can give you kind of a, uh, a sanity check when you're getting, when you're getting the information from the government that's saying, um, you know, it's been a week, it's safe to go out. You know, it's been about a month, you know, food's growing, it's safe to eat the food. Uh, you know, if you get a, a book like that, you're going to be able to have information that is unbiased and was created during a time when it didn't really matter what the answer was, all they were interested in was what was true. And that's what you want, that's what I want, is what's true, what's, not what's politically advantageous at the time, but what's the actual real deal here. So. Start getting information now and, and trust that information and understand that the government is going to be releasing information that is to their benefit and to some degree to the public benefit, but not to the individual's benefit. Okay, that's number two. Now I'm going to nail it this time three fingers. What's number three? The, the third thing that you can do to protect your family from you know, radiation and everything is understand that you're probably going to fail to a large degree. I'm probably going to fail to a large degree. Uh, you know, having been a prepper for, you know, the bit, you know, probably a couple decades at this point, uh, there are a lot of challenges in the world that uh, you can prepare for and you can overcome them. Like uh, getting locked out of your house. You can prep for that by putting a key outside and it's pretty darn 100% effective. You hide that key, you get locked out of your house, you can, uh, you know, you, you can survive that situation. Uh, you're in a car accident. If you had your seatbelt on, you prepped by putting on your seatbelt, you know, that's going to uh, go a long way towards uh, protecting you and allowing you to walk away from that. Even things like wildfires, you know, if there's wildfire in your area, have a grab and go bag ready to go. You can get out of the area, take the essentials that you need, like medicines that you wouldn't want to forget at home, all that kind of stuff. You can survive that, you can get to a place of safety, and then you can kind of figure it out from there. Nuclear war is different. It's at a totally different level than anything that people uh, can prep for. And, you know, the bad news is that it's, it's not particularly survivable. And by survivable, I mean that it's not particularly possible for you to do things that will allow you to get through it and get to the other side 
kind of unscathed to kind of pick your life back up. Because that's what we do as preppers. It's like, you know, we get ready for things and we prepare for the idea that, you know, we'll just get through it, we'll muddle through it, we'll get to the other side, and then we'll, uh, you know, we'll, 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 we'll pick up the pieces. Uh, and, and nuclear war is not that at all because it, it leaves a scar on the entire planet in a way that takes geologic time scales almost to, to heal. And uh, human beings don't live on a geologic time scale. We live on a human time scale. Uh, you know, I mentioned at the beginning of this video that if you are, sh you have a place to shelter in, you know, after an, a nuclear event, that you would want to be in there for like two or three weeks. Well, after two or three weeks and you go outside, the world's not back to normal. And by that I don't mean, oh, well, some buildings toppled over and, you know, maybe there was some wildfires set or whatever. The world would be a different place if there is a large-scale nuclear exchange and there is a lot of debris that's thrown up into the uh, into the sky. Uh, that would cloud the sky for years, and we would have several years of not the best summers. <laughs> I can tell you that. Um, you know, it, it would be cold for a while, uh, and cold means you can't grow food. A lot of animals. Who depend on the natural cycle of the ecosystem are going to die. So you know, you think, oh, I, you know, I, I got my bow and arrow, I got my rifle, I'll just go out and hunt whatever I need. Um, you know, a lot of those animals are going to be dead, and even if they're not, you probably wouldn't want to eat them anyway because the entire landscape would be littered with radioactive debris. Now, the worst of it uh, bubbles by in the first, you know, couple hours, couple days, couple weeks, but it persists long after that. Look at the Chernobyl site. Now I know a nuclear meltdown at a uh, uh, energy facility is different than a, uh, a nuclear weapons exchange. Uh, the power plants tend to actually be worse because they're right down there at ground level. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're getting a lot of the material right from the ground, whereas uh, nuclear detonations, at least in theory, uh, you know, they, they aim for being a little bit higher, so you're not, um, you're not getting you know, quite as much of the radioactive fallout from a nuclear bomb that you would from a nuclear power plant melting down. Uh, not to say that nuclear power plants won't melt down if there's a nuclear war on you, you have to deal with both of those things. But um, you, know, look, you know, look at the Chernobyl site and you know, it's decades and decades and it's still not safe to live there. So the world that we would be re-entering even if we survive that first you know, two weeks, three weeks, is going to be a world that's cold, that's low on food, that's radioactive. You know, if, if you go out of your shelter, you know, yeah, i, I got to do more research on this myself, but I'll be sleeping in the shelter for a couple of weeks, you know, two or three weeks if there's a nuclear exchange. After that, I might do things outside. You know, there might be you know, things I, I, I want to get done. I, I don't know what that might be. But when I'm going outside, especially at the beginning, I'm probably going to be wearing gear. I'm probably going to be wearing a respirator. I'm not going to be wanting to breathe in the, the particles that remain. They're not as dangerous as they were two weeks ago, but they're still not things that I want in my lungs. And I'm probably still going to be spending most of my spare time, and certainly my sleeping time, in here. And that's a different life. So, nuclear war is survivable, but the life that's waiting for all of us after it is really going to suck for most of us, um, and for, for all of us to some degree. Uh, and I think we all need to be mentally prepared for that, that nuclear war is not a, it's not a disaster like anything else that people commonly interact with. You know, yeah, your house burns down, you can build a new house. Your planet gets irradiated. There ain't no other planet that we can go to. And we're, you know, for the rest of, you know, people my age, for the rest of our lives, you know, our planet's going to be like that, and a lot of our kids are going to get cancer, and, you know, we're going to be seeing family members dying of the long-term impacts of all of that. Um, you have to accept that that's going to be part of the deal, and, you know, do you want to survive into that world? I do. That's just my knee-jerk reaction. You know, um, I can always decide down the road I don't want to survive anymore, but, uh, you know, until that point, I'm just going to do the best I can to protect myself, protect my family, and that's really all we can all do is the best we can. And, you know, you improve your chances by thinking about things ahead of time, you know, getting some assets ready for yourself. Uh, but you gotta remember that, you know, there's only so much you can do. The information that we're gonna be getting after the fact is gonna be skewed at best. And 
we all have to be prepared to fail to some degree at this because you know either way you cut it nuclear war sucks it's awful it's barely survivable and the world that we're going to get afterwards is really going to suck but as a human being as a life form all i can do is just uh do the best i can and say you know Life is pretty awesome, and I just like another day, I'd like another day, I'd like another day, and you just uh, you bring that forward. But do yourself a favor now, and, and get some assets for yourself, because uh, you know the more prepared you are now, the slightly less awful that future will be. Um, and uh, and you know maybe maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong about this. Maybe a lot of people who have done uh, thinking and and the science about this have. Uh, you know, exaggerated how bad it would be. I'd love if that was the case. I don't think that that's the case because, uh, you know, as we've seen with climate change, uh, scientists tend to actually underestimate how awful things are. You know, most of the official uh, estimates of, you know, how bad climate change was going to be and how fast it was going to progress were actually low balls, and the reality of it has uh, been faster, more intense, and worse than the scientists were expecting. Um, and I think that's human nature, that when people are thinking about these things, they, uh, they don't want to think of them as being as bad as they potentially are. So the possibility is, is as bad as everything I've just described to you is, the reality could be even worse. So be ready for that, because it might be the case. Not because we want it, but, you know, you don't pick your reality. All you do is choose how you interact with it. That's it. Good luck, and thanks for watching. This episode has been brought to you in part by Prescott Caliber Club and Jeske Defense Strategies. Prescott Caliber Club is a federally licensed firearm manufacturer and retail store specializing in firearms, survival gear, and producing great online content. If you want to thank them for supporting this channel, go check them out at prescottcalclub.com. Please subscribe and tune in every Friday at 4.30 New York time for a new video. And if you'd like to support this channel, you can do so both through Patreon or PayPal.